continuing medical education credit. Uh, you'll receive a survey from us within 24 hours of completing this webinar. At the end of the survey, you'll find a link to a self-reporting website uh, that the American Academy of Family Physicians um, has where you can claim your CME credit. With that, uh, Dr. Tulo, take it away. Okay. Thanks again, Tom. So um, today we will be uh, going over what I think are some of the um, major and, and most important points when we are attempting to integrate uh, medical students and residency residents into our uh, private practice. I, uh, as a medical director of a, a large clinic, will often be doing be involved with this with uh, both my. Uh, the doctor who's working with the medical students and is organizing the clerkship here, and also uh, during our residency at the beginning of uh, our residence uh, orientation period. Um, and I think, again, um, the use of the teaching physician is an excellent tool, uh, which really can give uh, physicians who are very, very busy the opportunity to get nuggets of information that can really enhance uh, the experience of our learners, and on top of that, also uh, enhance the uh, the experience for the for the patient, and also make the uh, teaching experience enjoyable for the teacher. So we will be uh, going over some major points and, and what I think are important points in integrating a learner, and then uh, later on in the. Uh, presentation, I will uh, go to the teaching physician site and just have show you how to navigate through the system to be able to use it uh, to the best of its ability. So uh, as we are, as you can see, our learning objectives for this uh, presentation are up. Um, what we, I'd like to try to go over uh, during this hour is how to prepare your staff to integrate the learner into the office and how to optimize that experience for our learners. Um, setting goals for the learners during their time in the office, evaluating learners' needs, the time management skills to maximize efficiency in teaching. And this is often a, a large concern on the part of teachers who are bringing pay, um, learners into their office, enriching the patient experience with the assistance of the learner, and appropriate physician documentation requirements when working with medical students and residents. Next slide, please. So often uh, new preceptors who are bringing learners into their office often have concerns about how this will affect their practice. Um, often they're worried about uh, prolonged wait times for their patients. They're also concerned about how their patients will react to the, um, excuse me, to the, um, how they will react to uh, the learner in their office. Uh, this is uh, often, many studies have shown that patients often will not uh, have a, will not consider the longer wait uh, that horrible, can, taking into consideration that they feel that they are part of a learning process for their students. So they almost feel that being a, uh, a part of the teaching process is sort of an added bonus to their encounter with uh, patients and many of my patients uh, and who work with my learners are really excited about being um, being part of the teaching process for these new and future doctors. So besides uh, that, they also how do we organize our practice? And you know, can I organize my practice to still see my patients, still give the best possible care, and still give be a great teacher? Uh, understanding where the learner's level of ability is, so they can sort of better understand what the, what the learner will be, um, what they're able to do and what they aren't able to do. Delineating expectations uh, between both the, the teacher, the student, and also the uh, medical school's uh, expectations. Time management, which again is an extremely important um, concern on the part of, of teaching physicians because again, we do want to see our patients in a timely fashion and keep up the patient's uh, level of happiness with uh, the time in the office. And finally, documentation and billing, because inappropriate documentation and or billing can uh, in cause an impact on the bottom line of the practice. Next slide. So uh, this graph 
I, I often use with my uh, new teachers uh, who come to the program, new attendings, um, is done by Simon Davis, Peters, Skeff, and Fletcher on how do you how do precepting physicians select patients for teaching medical students, and uh, it really shows three major domains: an educational value, a time and efficiency domain, and a doctor-patient relationship. And again, as you can see, these three domains intersect both in two points between two circles, uh, one point between two circles, and one point between all three uh, circles. And really what it, it's showing us is that uh, when we give more time to the doctor-patient relationship and the education, so if we're spending more time with our patients and spending more time uh, teaching, we can often compromise our time efficiency. Uh, on the other hand, if we're giving more uh, to time efficiency and to patient doctor relationship, uh, that really can compromise the education that we're giving our, our medical students. But there's that one point where all three uh, domains intersect, and I like to call that the, uh, the teaching sweet spot. Uh, for anyone who's played tennis or baseball or golf, there's that one point on the club, the racket, or the baseball bat that when you hit the ball, you really feel that you're driving it as best as possible. And this is where we as teachers really want to be able to uh, sort of mix the balance of the three domains to optimize all three and not to make sure that we don't neglect any of the three domains. Next slide. So where do we start? Well, we usually start by, I usually start by preparing my office and, their st and my staff. Again, uh, it can be very disconcerting to a staff when all of a sudden in walks this person who says, hi, I'm here, I'm supposed to be working here, and they really don't know who this person is. So I usually, whenever we have a new uh, group of uh, medical students that are coming through, I like to let my staff know that they'll be a learner, either a medical student or when there's a new group of residents coming through, that they will be coming through the office so they get uh, sort of a relationship with them and understand who they are and makes my staff a little bit more comfortable on integrating that learner into the practice. Then I, I speak to uh, the people who work in my office about how they can have a role in being a teacher with uh, these new uh, learners. I, I speak to my medical assistant and nurses and I talk to them about, you know, that they can give, they can give education to these uh, learners by Example, teaching them how to give vaccines or how to use a glucometer or how to, um, how to use, do PFTs in the office or um, even things like blood draws that met many medical students haven't had a lot of experience with. And then I speak to my office staff, uh, many of my registrars or my billers and coders or um, the, my, the, staff, the person in my office that does my prior authorizations that if you know, I send a, a medical student or if one of the, my residents go to discuss with them, you know, how to do certain uh, things like getting a prior authorization, to sort of walk them through it and let them understand uh, the more business end of, uh, of the medical practice and the medical office. Again, this can often be an extra added uh, enriching uh, teaching point that they uh, can have while uh, being in the office with you. And then I often try to tailor my patient flow uh, to the arrival of a learner. So often I will double book my first two sessions of the morning to be able to have um, at least one patient available uh, so that I can have them see the, med uh, the medical student while I'm seeing another patient. So I will have for my first slot two patients and my second slot two patients. And that will then allow me to see other patients while the medical student is with uh, the patient that I've assigned them. Uh, I also try to open up a slot in the end of the day to hopefully uh, be able to do a little wrap-up with my patient, with the student. Next slide. Well, then after this all has occurred before um, the medical student or the resident has come to the office, and uh, next we would be working on setting goals for the learner. Many times learners come from different types of um, rotations. They could have done all inpatient rotations and really haven't worked in, a, in, a, in an office setting. 
So I, I like to set goals for the learner. And the first thing I like to discuss is the number of patients they need to see. And I put need uh, in quotations because I, I personally feel that often need is, is relative. Um, often medical schools will require a certain amount of patients that they need to see during their experience, and I take that into consideration. But I also want to make sure that the learner has enough time to spend with the patient to really get a good educational experience, allow them to ask the questions they need to ask, and give them a little bit of time to try to think out the, uh, the plan and uh, the assessment on the patient. Next, I speak about things that I think are very important, which is professionalism. I talk to them about their hours that they need to be in the office, when, they sh when I expect them into the office, how long office hours run for, when usually lunch will be. Um, I talk to them about dress code. Uh, with the dress code, I often will tell them in more for uh, to sort of be a little bit more uniform amongst us, but also to belay some anxiety. Again. Uh, Office attire can vary from one office to another. Um, you can go from an office where you know a, a polo shirt and a pair of khaki pants is acceptable, and another office where a shirt and tie with a white coat is is more the attire of the office. And again, no re no medical student wishes to walk into an office wearing a polo shirt and khakis when the rest of the uh, staff is all dressed up in a more formal way. So this will help uh, relax uh, the medical student. I also go over office policies. Again, which staff does what and, uh, example, who will bring the patient into the, uh, from the waiting room to the office? Will it be the doctor? Will it be the nurse? Will it be the secretary? Um, where labs uh, need to be, where the patient needs to be sent for labs and things like that. I also talk to them about that if for any reason they are going to be sick, that um, they can uh, call up whatever number I told them to to contact us about being ill and obviously contact their uh, courtship director also about uh, being ill. Uh, then I like to talk to them about their role when seeing patients. And I often tell them that their role is really that of a learner. They need to try to learn from every patient that they see. They need to understand. Uh, what's happening, or at least attempt to understand what's happening, try to formulate a differential diagnosis, and maybe even consider a plan depending on where they are in their um, in, on the learning curve. Uh, I also speak to them about what I expect, what part of the physical exam I expect them not to do. So I often will tell them that they should avoid doing uh, genitalia, rectal, or breast exam without myself um, in the office. So this way here, there are at, Having told them this, I just try to make sure that there is no uh, stone left unturned when I'm giving them um, indications. Next slide. Uh, then uh, the uh, next thing I discussed with them about documentation. And again, from office to office, this may vary. Uh, if someone has an electronic medical record, they, like I have, we have in our clinic, we allow our medical students when they're working with attendings to um, to document in the chart so that we can review their documentation and discuss uh, you know, how they can improve documentation, what they've done well, what they need to work on. Uh, if for some reason that is not available, that option, then you know, maybe writing it on a, a separate progress note on a, uh, on a separate paper progress note so that they can be reviewed so that the learner can understand what they need to improve on. So documentation and how it needs to be documented. It's very important. Uh, next, I go over expectations. And the expectations really are, are three-pronged, both the learners, the schools, and my uh, expectations. I speak to the learner about what they would like to get out of this rotation, what they feel that they need to work on more. I, and I just probe and try to understand what they really uh, want to get out of the rotation. Then, of course, there are the schools, uh, the schools requirements and expectations. Some schools will require uh, a formal uh, ob a direct observation with a form to be filled out. So I will tell them that some session during their time with me, I will fill this out. Uh, other, you know, and I will go over how the evaluations, if they're not sure about how I would evaluate um, using the, the school's forms, how I will evaluate them. And finally, I go over what my expectations are. And I usually tell them that my expectations are that they learn, 
uh, from every case, that they ask questions when they're not sure, uh, that they can say, I don't know, to questions. Because often medical students are concerned about using the I don't know uh, because they're concerned that this is showing a lack of knowledge. But I reassure them uh, about how they need to uh, learn. And often saying I don't know is a way for me to be able to explain something to them. And even making mistakes is another great way for me to teach them because we can go through their thought process and try to evaluate where they made a mistake. Is it a fund of knowledge problem or is it a, uh, a thought process, a clinical problem solving process? So I go over these expectations. And while I'm speaking to them, I'm attempting to create a safe learning environment where they feel that they won't be judged for a mistake. I often tell them, I don't mind if you make a mistake or an error. I will be more concerned if the same situation arises and you make the same mistake because we, we do want, I do want him or her to learn from their mistakes. Um, finally, I give them a tour of the office. I, my, uh, medical center, my clinic is fairly large, and so therefore I usually like to give uh, the students a, a tour of the place. Either myself or one of the other attendings will do this. And I think it's important because you, they need to know where the exam rooms are, where the lab is, where if there's a you know x-ray room, where that is, um, where medical records will be if there are still paper charts, where they can have lunch if there's a, a room, a downtime room for the staff to go eat lunch at. So giving them a tour of the office makes them feel a little bit more uh, comfortable with the site that they're at. Next slide. Next, I, um, I like to evaluate what the learner's needs are because, again, I often I want to be able to know what I need to teach and what things I'm, they make them understand what they need to work with. So I often begin asking the learner what their level of knowledge and experience is. What have they done? What what do they feel comfortable with? What do they, you know, do they feel they're more comfortable with medical knowledge as opposed to clinical problem solving skills? Do they feel that they have areas where they can improve? Again, this is often a little difficult because and I know medical school student wants to tell you that, you know, where they have um, areas that they need to work on, but I try to do that in a in a safe learning environment and make them understand that the more I understand what they need, the better I can tailor my teaching to them. Um, I also speak to them about what rotations they've done. Often, especially like in September or August, I will have a uh, medical student that has only done surgical rotations. So they really have no experience in uh, you know, evaluating medical issues or even being in an outpatient setting. And I ask them what they uh, get to do on those rotations. What did they do? Did they, were they just running around getting x-rays read or CT scans read or were they actively involved in um, evaluating the patients and how do they feel do they feel comfortable with their physical exams I also often speak to them about what type of patients they saw many of the medical students will come and my office has a large amount of pediatric patients and many of them have never evaluated a pediatric patient my uh, my clinic often has newborns that come in five days old seven day old and I see um, these terrified faces of medical students not knowing how to even touch a child that small. Um, so that's a great way for me to understand what I need to teach and where I could help them uh, feel more comfortable. And finally, what procedures have they done and which would they like to learn? Maybe oh, they've done a whole bunch of ABGs in the hospital but have never given a vaccine. So I can tailor uh, the, um, the teaching by one of my staff on Let's show them how to give a vaccine once, and then I'll come in and watch them get, give a vaccine to the patient. So these are great ways to tailor the education that you need to give to the learner on what they need from you. Next slide. The one thing I always say is all learners are not all the same. I've had learners who have excellent uh, fund of knowledge. Uh, they know if you ask them a question directly, they will give you an answer. But they need a little nudging to use that knowledge in a clinical problem-solving fashion. Others have, I, I've noticed, have some 
issues with some areas of their medical knowledge, but once you uh, present them with a clinical solving problem, they are pretty good at it. So I, I will work on telling, you know, the second ones how we work, the first ones how we work through a problem solving using their knowledge. And the, the, the second, I will talk to them about reading up on topics that they have areas where they need to fill in some blanks. Um, many of the times to help me evaluate, I do some shared patient visits, especially at the beginning of uh, I, I'm, I'm a third year of medical students, where they really might not have a lot of comfort doing physical exams, so I'd like, especially in a uh, outpatient setting. So what I'll do is I'll bring them in and we'll walk through uh, a uh, an encounter together. Or what I may do is have them do the history and the review of systems, and then I'll come in, we'll discuss that, and we'll uh, go through the physical exam portion. Or I'll go in directly at the beginning with them and let them do the history and the review of system and the history of presenting illness, and then I will uh, do the physical exam together. So I tailor my, I break up the direct observation and the shared um, patient visits to streamline my time and to have better time management. Um, next slide. So uh, one of the major uh, concerns from anybody who has a, uh, an office that is integrating a, uh, a medical student is making sure that the uh, patient flow still stays within an acceptable uh, time frame. And again, time management is extremely important. So uh, this is as often is one of the major concerns on the part of uh, teachers, but overall, even though there is sometimes a little bit of a longer wait time, many uh, patients, knowing that they're going to be involved in training either medical students or residents, are a little bit more receptive um, to waiting a little bit just so they can be part of the teaching uh, experience. So I, as I said, I like to tailor my schedule to optimize teaching, um, and that would be by like I said, early uh, scheduling of you know extra patients so that we can I can have them seeing one patient while I see others. I choose the patients for the learner. It's very important that you choose the appropriate uh, patient. I, I rarely, if ever, will give a, a learner a completely new patient just because there is a lot of redundancy. Uh, because they will ask their questions, and since I don't know the patient at all, I will probably have to go through everything again completely. Um, while uh, when I give them one of my established patients, they I will know a lot about the patient and feel uh, more comfortable giving these patients to uh, the learner. Then I, I do my direct, direct observation, and once again, I do it broken up, because again, it can really be time consuming to do uh, the pay direct observation just doing a whole session. So what I will do is I watch them do their history of presenting illness and their whole history portion. Uh, I'll try to give them some feedback. I'll ask some other questions myself and then we'll go do the physical exam together um, and then we'll discuss the assessment and plan. For, and further down I will have them go and do their history when I feel comfortable in their history taking skills, and then I'll come in and do the physical exam with them after they've presented the history portion, and I've reconfirmed that with uh, the patient. And then precepting the case. Again, precepting, I often try to uh, give feedback. I precept the case with the, uh, the learner, sometimes in the office, sometimes out, and I'll go over that a little further on. But again, I can do sometimes classical uh, precepting, or I can sometimes do precepting in the room. And finally, wrap up, which I think is extremely important, because as I precept the case, I try to teach the, uh, the learner some tidbits along the way, picking one topic. But often, if time it restricts us from spending a lot of time on something, I usually, by the at the end of both of my morning session afternoon session, we'll sit down for about 15 minutes, discuss what they've done well, discuss what I feel that they need to work on, and I speak to them about any uh, medical management that we've gone over that they weren't sure about and they wanted more information about. So next slide. 
so what I've done here is really pretty much laid out how I structure a visit with, um, with a, a learner. So the first thing is, as I said, I choose the patient for the learner. And I make sure that they're patients that I know well, that I know that I can give uh, to the learner, and I know often what their major issues are. And when I do that, I give a quick overview of the patient. I tell them about any psychosocial issues. I'll discuss their uh, general history, uh, what medications they're on. I also will review the last encounter with that patient and tell the learner what issues need to be addressed at that appointment so they can go in with a plan. Um, and the other reason why I like to tell uh, the learner issues that they may need to address is that often many of my patients can be extremely um, loquacious and speak uh, for long times and become tangential and present things that happened 10 years ago but have resolved nine years ago or things that they're concerned about that could happen in the future. And often the medical student can get lost with these patients. So I tell them, let them talk, give them a little bit, of, you know, find out what's happening. But then when, you know, you've given them about 10, 15 minutes of discussion, use these issues that we need to address at this appointment as a way to close the encounter. Um, I also tell them about how much time I hope for them to, uh, to take with each patient. And that will depend on how many issues I, I presume that the patient will have. If it's a patient who's a child who's coming in for a well visit, I'll tell them a certain amount of time, say 15 or 20 minutes. On the other hand, if I have a patient who has diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, COPD, CAD, and many other, um, many other problems, I'll tell the rest of that medical student that they can take 25 or 30 minutes um, to discuss uh, with the patient and do their history and physical. Often what I will do is also let them know if I see that they're running over, I will enter into the, uh, into the office in the exam room and sort of try to guide the, uh, the patient, the encounter from that point forward. I then bring the uh, medical student in and I present them to the patient. And I also, when I choose my patients, I also make sure I choose patients that are receptive to having medical students. Not all my patients are receptive to working with uh, medical students. So I sort of try to avoid uh, bringing them in because often that can create a, a more difficult learning environment for the learner. Um, and then what do I do in the meantime? Well, one of the things I'll be doing is trying to see patients. I will sort of put two or three acute patients or quicker patients in, and I will try to see them while the learner is in. If I don't have anyone um, waiting for me or if I only have one person waiting for me, once I complete that, I will go and, and do some uh, paperwork and charting um, with the um, in the meantime, or if I've gotten phone calls from uh, pharmacies or uh, from patients, I attempt to return those phone calls to better be able to give um, the full time to the medical student, but also uh, cover what I need to do for my office. Next slide. Then I, I precept the case. And again, speaking about it, I, if there is issues like uh, that it's an STI issue or there's something more sensitive, I will make sure that the uh, medical student will um, come out of the room and we'll discuss the case uh, outside and then we'll set up a plan and I'll try to explain to them at least why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, if there's a teaching point, I will try to spend a minute or two on teaching if I can at that moment. If on the other hand I know the patient is receptive and um, appreciates you know, the, a discussion, a clinical discussion with both of us in the room with them, I'll also do that in the room. Often uh, it will make the encounter a little quicker because we'll discuss the case and, um, and we'll be able to uh, figure out a plan a little quicker while we're in the room as opposed to stepping out and going back in. Uh, I also take into consideration my very anxious patients. Those are patients that I don't necessarily want to discuss, um, you know, sort of our thought process in the room because often they can get very agitated, you know, when they hear things that they're not really understanding. And then the feedback. The feedback, again, I try as often as possible and teachers should try as often as possible to try to give the feedback as quickly as possible. Um, medical students 
learners in general uh, do much better being able to sort of connect the experience and the teaching point and the feedback um, when they're closer together. Obviously, we do have to work within restrictions of um, of our uh, our patient panels and our flow. So what we often do, will do is we will um, I will sometimes have to lay off giving them some feedback at that point or explaining more to them. And I will that's when I will use my um, my free time at the end of each session or to discuss problems with them. The other thing that I think is extremely important is um, I attempt to try to reschedule follow-ups with these patients that the medical students have seen uh, within that time period that the medical student is rotating with me. I, uh, I feel that often when I have a patient that comes in who might have a cough secondary to an ACE inhibitor, and we've discussed that maybe that's the reason why this patient has this dry cough, I will bring, uh, I'll have the patient come back in two weeks so that the medical student can sort of see, did this help? You know, oh no, it didn't help, so maybe it wasn't the ACE inhibitor, maybe it's his post-nasal drip that we need to address uh, and improve the management on. Or, oh yes, the ACE inhibitor did improve, so that sort of reinforces to the um, medical students how their uh, management was appropriate and how the outcome was the desired outcome. So again, often that will um, be a, a, a great teaching point for uh, the student. Also, it allows them to sort of understand the, the process of the uh, continuity of care that's, that family physicians really thrive in. And um, it allows them to sort of develop a little bit of a relationship with patients. Uh, next slide. Uh, many, uh, many studies have been done about patient appreciation and patient satisfaction with um, working with medical students. And I personally feel that one of the points that really helps me a lot is that it does enrich what my, at least from my point of view, uh, patient encounters and with, when the learner is there. Many times my medical students will go in and really have work on their on complex psychosocial needs that the patient might have and speak to them about it. And often the patient really appreciates that. And there have been times where little uh, pieces of information have come out of those interviews. The medical students often feel more comfortable with the psychosocial where they can really feel that they can thrive and um, and they feel more comfortable with that. So this really helps them uh, boost their self-esteem on patient interviewing and sort of allows them to sort of create that bond with patients that I think is integral. It's very important in uh, learning how to work with uh, patients. The other thing that I often uh, work on is using uh, them, the using medical students and allowing medical students to be teachers to the patients. Uh, often I will have handouts. Um, printed out handouts that we can give the patients about their pathologies and about uh, their illnesses. And I ha go over them with the medical students and have them sort of educate the patient using those uh, handouts and having them understand, you know, this is why you need to uh, eat a, a low-carb uh, diet with your diabetes. And these are the type of foods that have are carb rich and you should really be avoiding these with your uh, pathology. Or these are the foods that are high cholesterol uh, foods. So this is why we want you to avoid these because of your hyperlipidemia. Um, many, uh, many times uh, there are some really great medical websites that explain to uh, patients uh, you know, their, their pathologies. And having the medical students really show them and show them the site and navigate towards those sites so that the patients can educate themselves but also be educated about those sites by the learners is a great um, is a great tool for the uh, learner um, and finally often I we will you know I will have a plan together a patient comes in with um, joint pain and we've attempted uh, multiple medical um, therapies that really haven't worked and I might decide to send them to physical therapy well I'll have the medical student will go over we'll discuss um, why we're sending them to physical therapy what is the purpose of the physical therapy, what are our goals, help have the 
medical student better establish um, what the goals of the patient is and bring that back to me and, they, and then we'll go back in together and discuss what are more realistic goals because sometimes patients goals might be unrealistic so being able to use um, have the learner be part of the education process really will help the um, help the patient and help the teaching physician um, in the management of these patients. Next slide. Finally, one of the most important things for any teaching physician is appropriate documentation. Again, um, we wish to document appropriately because we want to get paid for our um, for our services rendered, and also we want to be able to document appropriately uh, and not and fall and fall within Medicare rules and and not fall out of those rules. So, um, Medicare rules on Medicare on, on billable services states that you must it must be performed in the physical presence of the teaching physician for a service that needs teaching physician billing requirements. So that's a very very important point. Um, for a medical student, uh, their documentation, their note that is written can be referred by the, attend phys at the, the teaching physician only in the review of system, the past family, the past medical history, family and surgical history, of course, family history and social history. The history of presenting illness, the physical exam, the medical, the assessment and plan, or the medic medical decision making must be redocumented by the, uh, the teaching physician in their note completely for it to be uh, an acceptable uh, documentation. Um, often if there is a, uh, a, a note written by a medical student or resident in an electronic health record or medical record, we often um, want to go over uh, the note, make sure that there is no discrepancy between what the medical student wrote or the resident wrote and your note. Uh, we also, I also like to attach an attestation that states that I've reviewed the note, that I've, um, that I've felt that the note is appropriate and that they should refer to my note for further documentation. Uh, and again, then my note is a full note that usually pretty much documents everything. Uh, um, when we have payment of services through Medicare, there are pretty much three options. The first one is in the situation where uh, the services were personally furnished by a physician who is not a resident. So when you're in your regular office and you're seeing your patients, that would be your first option. The second is when it's furnished by a resident, when a teaching physician is physically present during the critical portion of the uh, service that is rendered. So. That would be uh, often within the first six months uh, if there is, a, you know, during a residency training or whenever there's a medical student, you sh the, the physician needs to be present during the critical um, portions of the service. And finally, where we have here the primary care exception, if in a, it's in an outpatient a department of a hospital or an ambulatory care clinic, where time is spent by resident patient care that is included under the direct graduate medical education payment, um, that allows the resident to see the patient without the attending necessarily physically be present to, in, uh, to see the, um, the patient, but must be precepted to the uh, attending prior to the patient's discharge. In those situations under the primary care exceptions, the ENM services or CPT codes that are acceptable for a new patient would be the 99201, the 99202, and 99203 for new patients. And for established patient would be the 99211, 99212, and 91213. So that would be the first level, second level, or third level services. So um, having stated all this, I'd like to go over to teaching physician a little bit and uh, just review some of the how you navigate through the site because I, I truly think that this is an excellent uh, learning tool and it's a great tool to allow uh, busy uh, community preceptors an opportunity to um, look at quick tips, uh, look at uh, vignettes, at, look at more in-depth resources to be able to help better um, work with medical students. But I don't personally feel that this is only this, this is only good for community preceptors. I think it's great uh, to, as a tool to use with medical students. 
oh, excuse me, with the residents. Residents who part of their ACGME requirements will be to teach medical students. This is a great way for them to be able to understand how to teach, to be able to sort of become more comfortable with the, um, with the teaching process. And again, I always say uh, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And again, I think it's a great, having gone through it many times, I really think it gives a lot of great uh, pieces of information, even for um, physicians who've been teaching for extended period of time. So here we have our home page uh, of the physician, teaching physician, where, uh, as you'll see, the, this classic three column um, sort of set up on the page, uh, where uh, on the top here we have several um, several tabs about us, how to become a preceptor, to register your preceptors, and preceptor resources. And I'd like to really click on that right now and move along to the next page. And here uh, we have pretty much all the major topics for preceptors, um, and it's set up in two possible with two possible tabs. One right below the uh, the, the bar where you can see the preparing your practice, integrating a learner, teaching strategies, and also down the middle where we have um, a little description about what each, um, what each tab will uh, describe and talk about. So uh, let us go to preparing your practice uh, just to show you, you can either click it here or up on the bar, either one is acceptable. So once again we are back at the uh, three column sort of layout. We're on the left side here. We have pretty much the topics that this tab, the Preparing Your Practice team, will be speaking about. Um, in the middle, we have some really great quick tips. And again, being uh, in a very busy clinic, often I don't have time to sit there and read a you know five-page article. What the teaching physician has done is taken from many different really great uh, articles uh, and they've, what they've done is put out some quick tips for us to really read through real quickly to get you thinking about how you can possibly tailor what you do to be able to improve uh, your teaching. Uh, on the right side, we have both our resources in the lower right quadrant, which really give us some great topics. Again, example, this one, how to be an efficient and effective preceptor, pearls of precepting here, which is an interactive module. Um, but what I really like is often, you know, I think many people with visual modeling, it really helps them understand how something, you know, how an encounter can go. And what we do have here is by pressing this uh, little uh, play uh, tab, what we will do is we'll see a vignette. And in this vignette, we have a, um, a physician speaking to one of his uh, staff about a new learner coming into the office and how they would like to sort of go about and how they, they're preparing them and telling them what their role will be in teaching uh, the medical student. Um, let us go to integrating a learner. Uh, once again, we have the, uh, the, a larger list of the quick tips uh, that will really go over uh, important points on uh, integrating a learner telling, you know, how, helping you along with that. There's a larger list now of resources. A great uh, resource is the precepting medical students in the era of EHRs. Many of our offices, if not all, are now set up with EHR, electric, electronic health records. And having that uh, and being able to understand how to document appropriately and how to precept uh, now, which, is which has changed a little bit compared to the older days with uh, paper charts, that's a really great tool. Um, and again, there's uh, an excellent article from Family Practice Management, which is the How to Be an Efficient uh, and Effective Preceptor, and from JAMA, which is Teaching Medical uh, Students in the Ambulatory Setting. And again, we can go down the left bar and click um, maybe our, the, the third topic, which is the first steps in orientation. And again, once again, there's a great vignette here with a teaching physician speaking to the medical student and explaining to them, you know, orienting them and explaining them what their expectations are and just sort of 
seeing this will also allow you to use some of the tidbits that are occurred during the vignette to be able to uh, really make the learner feel comfortable in the uh, teaching uh, environment that you've developed. Um, again, another great point that I really liked is the structuring of the visit, which again I've gone over. It's very important to really, especially with medical students in the, who have just started doing some clinical uh, work, and this is their first clinical work, to really establish a good structured visit for them will allow them to time management them time manage themselves better but also will allow them to get a better learning experience because you'll allow them to have the time to and the information to be able to get a good history get a good physical exam understand how to use those two to, to try to develop a differential diagnosis and then work towards um, having them try to figure out what, what besides now that they've had a differential diagnosis what they need to do, what tests they might want to order, what management they would like to do uh, with that. Um, and again, uh, another excellent uh, tab for anyone who's starting to integrate a person is the billing issues. Um, again, the evaluate, the precepting, uh, while we're moving to that page, the precepting and evaluating learners um, and again, giving feedback, there were some, there was a real, some really great uh, uh, webinars done by uh, Dr. Clinch uh, prior to me and for anyone who really wants to get some great uh, tips on uh, precepting, they are um, on the website, so please feel free to go there. Um, again, here there are a lot of great resources that come from CMS to be able to make you understand how, um, how to uh, guidelines for teaching physicians, interns, and residents, and again, the updates, Medicare claim processing, and coding for services and residency program for anyone who does work there. So I often have my new um, my new uh, attendings who come in really take a look at this site because I think it's a great uh, site and it gives them a lot of information to better uh, manage the patients uh, and also better uh, sort of learn this great um, profession of being a teacher and teaching uh, new medical students uh, and new physicians. So I think that is about it. Um, if we can go back to the um, to my PowerPoint. Okay, next slide. Um, after the questions, I do have a bibliography that will be up on the site. So for anybody who wishes to look at any of the um, articles that I use for this presentation, it will be there. And I guess I can open up the um, open up to questions. Well, the, this has been a great presentation, um, Dr. Tulo. Thank you for um, putting so much time and effort into it. I know um, you've had a, a, a difficult week with some things going on, so uh, uh, but this has been fantastic. Um, we don't have I don't see any questions yet from any of our um, webinar participants, but um, let me pitch one or two to you, and and uh, hopefully we'll. Uh, We'll get a couple from our participants. Um, sure. I love I, I loved the um, the sweet spot uh, diagram that you had put up there um, at the very beginning, and and I guess I was just wondering. I mean, you know, you, you made the analogy with golf and baseball, tennis, um, you know, and then I think the, the entire webinar was set up to um, to really kind of talk about how to get into that sweet spot. I, I guess I just thought, you know, if you could just summarize what's the what do you think is the, the number one or number two ways to get the physician and uh, the, the uh, preceptor and the student um, and, the, and the patient working in that sweet spot? What would you say that that would be? Well, I, I, I oft, I, again, I, it all starts with expectations. Uh, it, uh, delineating the appropriate expectations for the, um, the learner making them understand what your expectations are, understanding their expectation, and really also choosing patients that are, are energized and excited about participating in, um, in teaching and being part of the teaching process. Again, I cannot, uh, just the other day, I had a, a medical student that was working with me, and I had two of the mo of, you know, patients that are very quiet, that don't say much, absolutely rave about them. 
Uh, she, was, she was timely because we had set up limits and expectations, and I explained to her what I was expecting from her. And having the, um, the patients really rave about how great, you know, how well she clicked with them, how well she established a rapport with them, how well she uh, pretty much moved through the exam was great for myself because I'm happy to see my patients happy. Uh, I realized that the patient was happy about the encounter, and I also uh, was, the, I could see that the medical student was truly happy about knowing that they pleased the patient. They did what they want, what they need to do as a physician. They were able to do what they needed to do from a medical point of view, but they were also able to do what they needed to do from a uh, humanistic point of view, which I think that's really where the, um, the, the process really needs to go. Again, it's not always easy. That doesn't always happen. But I think overall, uh, when you are, when you can set up these expectations and set up uh, the medical student to succeed, that that's where and when you hit the sweet spot. Great. Well, that's um, that's a great answer. I, I guess uh, if you ever play golf with me, then we'll have to talk about expectations. So oh, you'll know why I'm not in the sweet spot. <laughs> well, my, my expectations was we'll be rummaging through the uh, the rough a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, still don't see any questions from participants. One more, um, and we're just about out of time. Um, you mentioned that you are very strategic about um, pairing your your students with patients. You know, and I, and I guess I wondered um, if you do that. I mean, I guess how how do you do that? I mean, you said you never put a a, page, a new patient with a, with, a med, with a student, but um, you know, do you look at personality characteristics? Do you put male patients with male uh, students? I mean, are, 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 can you say a little bit more about maybe strategically how you do that? Sure. Um, well, again, first, I, I'll never say never. I try as much as possible not to put a, a new patient with them. Uh, depends also on how comfortable I am with the medical student. If the med if I see a medical student that really you know gets it and is really doing well, I and there's a new patient, I might uh, give them the new patient. I don't necessarily say no uh, or say, exclusively say they cannot see that. Uh, it depends a lot on how I've been evaluating. There might be a, pay, a medical student that at the beginning, obviously I won't give them that new patient, but if, uh, if they've shown me that they have excellent history and uh, physical skills and they really you know, are thorough, then maybe later on during the rotation, I will, and I'm working with them, I will tell them, would you like to see a new patient and try to work through that? And if they say yes, then I say, great, then let's try that. So again, often it's, you know, what I see um, with the, uh, the medical student, how, you know, how well they are working through what they need to work through, then I will give them more and more as they, you know, as they show me that they can take that. Um, the, I do not necessarily say a male patient with a male student or a female patient with a female student. Again, um, most of my patients who have have been with me for many years. Uh, they know that I have medical students with them. Again, uh, the the female uh, patients do not. Um, again, they won't. The medical student will not be doing any sort of genitalia or breast or rectal exam uh, by themselves. So the medical the patients know the the expectations on my part uh, with the medical students so they know they feel comfortable knowing that those things will not be done without me there uh, without me pretty much performing those part of the physical exam <coughs> excuse me and so um, I try to give them as much variety as possible because again if I give them all pediatric patients or I give them all you know male patients or all female female patients I'm really creating an issue with their learning experience. So I try to give them a little bit of everything. If I'll even ask them, have you seen a diabetic? Because I just have one of my patients who would be a good candidate as a diabetic. You know, have we have we worked with a diabetic together? And they said, no, I haven't seen a diabetic. Okay, so how about a patient with COPD? Have you we, have we have you seen one of those? Because again, sometimes I won't remember who they've seen or who they haven't as the rotation goes along. So I try to tailor it to try to make them see uh, patients from different age uh, groups. Uh, patients with different pathologies, uh, to be able to give them the most enriching uh, op, uh, in, in environment and uh, learning experience possible. So again, I, I don't ever say, 
you know, no, they can't do this person, or no, they can't do that. I, I try to give them, every, and, and the more they are able to, <clears throat> excuse me, the more they're able to uh, show me that they're able to do things, the more I'm going to sort of let them go in and see more and be more, uh, and give them more difficult patients to try to assess. Okay, great. And I, I think the theme here is setting expectations. I think you You've hit that uh, very well. So, well, thank you, Dr. Tulo. You did a great job with today's topic, the materials, and uh, just working through uh, a lot of information in a in a uh, in a short amount of time. Um, uh, let's see. Um, let's see. I do see a question. We do have like about a minute. Um, let's see. I am. Um, let's see. I am working on a curriculum review research and would like to know what suggestions you have for curriculum improvement utilizing your experience. Do you have okay. any suggestions? Well, uh, again, for, for the office, um, again, I often, I usually, the curric I, what I try to do is I try with my curriculum, I don't necessarily choose a set curriculum. What I do try to do is, is since my patient panel and um, the patient is fairly diverse from both very, very young children to very, very old or people in like their 80s and 90s, I have women, I have men, I try to really diversify as much as possible the pathologies that they see. And when I see issues of, you know, uh, knowledge base, you know, I'll have them read up on uh, certain topics, and if I have some time, uh, I want them to come back and talk to me about what they've learned, and you know, maybe go over, uh, you know, management of diabetes, or converting a patient from uh, from oral uh, anti hyperglycemics to insulin, so they can get a better understanding. So I usually tailor my curriculum to my patients, and since I have a fairly vast uh, diversity in my pathologies in my practice, that's how I usually set up the curriculum when they're working with me. Again, uh, we have multiple attendings at my clinic, so we they the, re the medical students have the opportunity to work with several physicians uh, here in my clinic, and so they're able to also see, you know, some of my uh, colleagues have more younger women, some of my colleagues have one of my colleagues is a geriatrician, so we'll see older patients. So we try to sort of, amongst us all, set up, you know, the major pathologies that a family doctor will see and make sure that they, the, the medical students are able to see as many of those possible. And again, pretty much your major, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, uh, hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, uh, GYN issues like uh, sexually transmitted uh, GI issues like uh, candidiasis, pap smears, health maintenance. Um, I, we try to just cover the major issues. And again, when you're going through your patients, it's a great opportunity to teach on health maintenance, on the appropriate vaccines at, at, at ages for both adults and children. And it's usually that's the way I teach by going through, you know, my patients. All right. Well, thank you. I'm glad we got that question in. Um, so again, thank you everybody who participated today. This was our fifth webinar on precepting and teaching physicians.